Hey, come on, your best pal. She's here. Who's here? She's here. Dora's here. It's Dora's with a cartel Maybe. It's stories and her dear friends. They live up in the sky. But for the chance to sing and dance, her friends would also buy. It's Doris. It's Doris, dear. She's a girl on the street. She'll show up with a sweet girl at door when she knocks on your door. That's her fault. Hi everybody, Doris Deer here, America's Perfect Housewife, and welcome back to Doris Deer's Girl Talk. We've had some great guests this season, and well, they really know how to talk. <laughs> so we're giving you a bonus. That's right. Without further ado, I give you part two of the interview, live from the Rumpus Room. So let's talk about Encores. Now you're involved at Encores over at City Center, which is an an amazing thing. So talk to me about Encores. What drew you into Encores? Well, I was the artistic director of Encores for 20 years. I stepped down moments before everything closed down, I must say. Uh, I was in the middle of my what would have been my last, well, what will turn out to have been my <laughs> last season, very <laughs> incomplete. We only got one of the three shows in front of an audience. Um, I mean, I'm a musical theater kid, you know, I mean, beginning with Peter Pan. So when Encores was being formed, uh, I was... On the I was asked by Ted Chapin, who is also a musical theater kid, born and bred, wrote the book on Follies, um, to come join the committee to figure out how to bring musical theater to city back to City Center. You know, there had been a very uh, successful musical theater program at City Center in the 50s and into mm -hmm. the early 60s, and then Lincoln Center got built, and Richard Rogers started a music theater uh, season at Lincoln Center, and City Center dried up. So now a woman named Judith Dakin, who was in charge of City Center, wanted to figure out how to do it. And so we had many meetings, and the choices that we made ultimately led to the birth of Encores in 1994. And the idea was a very simple idea, really, which was that, that we wanted to hear these shows the way they had sounded in their original productions, which meant that we had to have a full orchestra. We had to have enough singers. There was no consideration of dance at the time. Right. There was no consideration of production at the time. We were going to rehearse for five or six days. I wasn't the artistic director back then. Walter Bobby, well, Walter Bobby came in toward the end of the first season as the artistic director. Um, and what we were celebrating was the sound, the scores, the voices. The, this was what music theater sounded like in 1947 or 1927 right. or not, whenever this show happened. Mm -hmm. This is what the authors wrote and this is the audience they thought they were writing for would appreciate this. And it was as simple as that. And then over the years, it just grew. There began to be a little choreography, and then there began <laughs> to be a little costume. In those early shows, actors were asked to bring their own tuxedos and their own cocktail wear, and there was a, there was a apparel coordinator who helped. Um, but by the time I got there, these were almost full productions in a way. And uh, during the 20 years I was there, I, I, I'm sorry to say they grew even bigger because the artists just wanted to do more. They just they, yeah. they saw the potential to do more. Well, there I've been to so many of, of those productions and, um, you know, my husband is not really a musical theater guy. And he always says, wow, the sound, the sound of that orchestra. Yeah. Like you just don't, you just don't, you don't, you don't get it anymore. anymore. Yeah. I mean, you don't hear it. And as you said... Most shows don't even have an overture anymore. Right. I mean, and it's, I love, I love that over, you're sitting there, the theater goes dark, everyone hushes, and then they start. That yeah. orchestra starts and plays that overture, which is, I mean, yeah. it just, because I mean, I, for me, like music, it comes through you. It like, you, it, you hear the sound, but it, it goes inside you. Yeah. You know, it's I, and very it's, special. It's so and magical. it's very, it's it's unique in that a Broadway orchestra is different from a symphony orchestra. It's a different size for one thing, but also yeah. there's a style to it. There's a there's a there's a knowledge of what Broadway sounds like that nothing else ever sounded like. So that if you get the right players and the right conductor, and Rob Berman and Rob Fisher before him were certainly the right conductors, 
um, you hear that sound that you used to hear if you're as old as I am, <laughs> you know, 10, 15 times a year in a theater you would go and the lights would go down and the, over the orchestra was in the pit, our orchestra was on stage. Right. But, you know, the, yes, the, a spotlight would hit the back of the conductor's head and then this sound would happen. You yeah. Know? So magical. Now, of course, you're bringing older shows well, that probably wouldn't go on, although Chicago was one. Was Chicago one of your shows that then? Not mine, but Encore's. It was an encore. It was an encore, and then became well, the, like one of the longest hits on Broadway. It's, it's still there. It's still there, folks. It's still there. Yeah. Um, but you bring back shows that, in this day and age, are a little problematic in the way they mm-hmm. see the world. Mm-hmm. How did you guys deal with that? I well. Mean, when I was dealing with it, it was not nearly as problematic. I mean, a great deal of the discovery and the courage to speak up about these things happened in the last two years. So when we started with Fiorello in 1994, when I say we, it wasn't me, I was on the committee, you know. Um, the relationships in that show, the way that women are treated, you know, no one had a question about that. That was, right. that was just the way it was. It was just the way it was. It was the way it was. It was a way in 1960 it didn't bother anybody at all. And it hadn't bothered anybody when it really happened back in the 40s. Um, yeah. You know, when Fiorello really was the mayor. Or 30s. Um, but, you know, now you look at those things and you have to answer this question. Do we do this because it was done and it was not regarded as dangerous or offensive? Because it's important to keep that heritage alive so that we know where we came from. Or do we try to correct attitudes that were not considered incorrect in their time, but are considered incorrect now? And I think it's always going to be a compromise. Right. Well, I I remember us talking about you were, before you decided to retire from Encores, you were working on a show that, well... I mean, I'm in my 60s, but it didn't seem so long ago that Thoroughly Modern Millie was on Broadway. Yeah. What can I just see? Seem, seems like, wait, that was just a, three years ago. Yeah. But you were working on that, and we were talking about that. And that seems like a more modern, current musical in many ways to me in my head, my crazy head. But how pro- there were even It's prob- deeply problematic. Deeply. I mean, it's, I mean, it's much more problematic than Fiorello, you know. It's, yes. <laughs> I mean, wow. Yeah. But it, that's a, it's a show that in the form it was written in, when it was written, is actually, I think, unproducible today. So that the number of changes that would have had to have been made were very extensive. And COVID came to the rescue in that sense. It never got it on. Now, I have a note here and I have to read this. You also, you wrote the book of a musical, Time and Again? I did. What is a, a tale of time travel presented at the Manhattan Theater Club? And you'd like to be a librettist, a, lib- a librettist. Oh my gosh, a librettist stars, again. Stars. I know, a librettist again. again. Is to get to you. <laughs> After all, he says, there's always the hope of another sudden outbreak of unfettered joy. Yes, well. So tell me about Time and Again. Oh, Time and Again, I was very young, relative to how old I am now. Uh, was it, it is an extremely entertaining novel by Jack Finney uh, and a sort of a cult classic about New York about a guy who's in the advertising business who goes back, finds himself back in, from 1970 back in 1880 and unfortunately for logic falls in love in, in 1880 ah. but he lives in 1970 so how do you deal with that? Um, oh, time travel. <laughs> and it seemed like a good idea for a musical. Oh, the paradox. And a, 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 a guy named Skip Kennan wrote the music and lyrics, and it's a beautiful score. I did not write a very good book, and as I come to look back on it now, I think the issues are, are it has problematic issues at root that I didn't recognize at the time because it's about a very passive guy who gets thrown back into the past. And one of the things I say in my book, and I think it's practically the only inviolable rule of hit musicals, is you have to have an active hero. You have to have somebody who wants something. You have, yes. 
uh, you, you know, give me Madame Rose or Mama Rose and Gypsy who are going to make those two kids stars come hell or high water, and now right. I'm interested, you know. Right. A guy walking down the street thinking, I don't know the advertising business, I don't love it, I don't, and, you know, and somebody comes and says, how would you like to go back? It's very hard to get it off the ground, you know what uh -huh. I mean? Um, the rest of it was quite fascinating, I think, but I could not find a way to get it off the ground. So my, growing up on Staten Island, I, my, Taffy and Duke, down in the rumpus room, where the, they had a rumpus and went to the room with all their friends and drank and smoked all night and listened to comedy albums when they thought we were in, in bed. But they had a trunk, one of those old trunks. It was very trendy in the 70s. Yes. To take one of those old trunks and put wallpaper in the inside. I know, it's Daffy and her crafts. Um, but I the like trunk, that idea. Yeah, yeah, but the trunk was filled with Broadway LPs, all the CBS Masterworks. I mean, great stuff. And I would be in bed as it came through the vent, all of the Broadway music. Yeah. And it was really marvelous. So I went into the trunk and I pulled a little stack. Okay. And You're not I quiz think. Me, are you? So I'm going to quiz you. Okay. Well, we're not going to quiz you, but I'm going to I'm going to hold up the album and I just want, you know, you are the man. You wrote the book. You wrote the book, darling. He wrote the book. A book. A book. A book. But you're right. You're, I know you're writing another one. You got to keep writing. This is this is really great. I mean, this is this is great. Thank All you. right, first cup, nineteen forty four, before I was born, ran for eight hundred and sixty performances. Wow, whatever can it be? <laughs> Song of Norway. Song of Norway is a show I actually have seen. I saw it at the Jones Beach Marine Theater. That's what this is from. Is that Guy the Lombardo that? and Le Leonard Ruskin's Jones Beach Marine Theater presentation of Song of Norway. Now, Jones Beach Marine Theater is now a concert venue, but way back in the day, I, this must, I, I must have been about 11 when I saw this, um, there, was a, there was a gap between where the audience sat and the back of the stage, and it was water. And so right. the sets came in on came in on I barges. remember that. Yeah. Because that went happened for quite a while. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jones Beach Marine Theater was sort of a big summer thing to do. Yeah, because like, as an actor, it was one of those summer stuff right, places. Right, yeah, it's sort of like the St. Louis Muni or something Yeah, yeah, like yeah. So my parents took me to see Song of Norway, which is about Edvard Grieg, a subject I had not the slightest interest in at age Does 11. anybody know who I don't think I, I ever even heard of Edvard Grieg. <laughs> Um, but the story I heard later, the, the event has left no nothing in my mind whatsoever. Although John Reardon was in it, who is a you know a person of some legend. In the Sig Arno, uh, John Reardon, William Alvis, Helen, Helena Scott, Muriel O'Malley, and Brenda Lewis. Where well, are they now? I, I don't know. But John Reardon was on Sesame Street, and he was yeah. he was starred in Do Re Mi with Phil Silvers and uh, Nancy Walker. Anyway, the only interesting thing about that whole series which was told to me, and I'm not sure it's true, that Guy Lombardo was the music director of that series. And so he would arrive on a boat. He would come in on a boat, he would wave to the audience, he had his stick in his hand, his baton in his hand. He would get out of the boat, the orchestra pit was down low, right? The orchestra was there, and right. he would climb onto the orchestra pit and he would hold up his baton in his hand like this, and then the orchestra pit would sink into the place below. He would hand his baton to the associate conductor, get back in the boat and go home. <laughs> he never conducted a single oh note of any of those shows. <laughs> oh my God, I don't fantastic. know if it's true, but it's a great story. Well, it's a good story. Yes. We like that. Yeah. We like those good stories. All right, so that's Song in Norway. Yeah, well, yeah. you got to love the Vikings. It's very, very yeah, current. Yes, I mean, yes. Vikings are the all... The song in it called Freddy and His Fiddle that I remember trying to play on the piano years ago. Uh, Freddy, the legend, he'll drink. Freddy and His Fiddle. Yes, or at it in the time. Norwegian event. dance number two. Freddie and his fiddle make everybody dance. All right. All right. 1944. Okay, still not born. 657 performances. Okay, hit show. <sighs> Bloomer Girl. Bloomer Girl. Bloomer Girl, we did at Encores in my first season as artistic director. I'd always wanted to do it. Why? Um, I'd always wanted to do it be for two reasons. Because it's Harold Arlen, who is my lodestar. I mean, I'm the Harold Arlen, you know, give me Harold Arlen. Um, composer, and uh, and it had a song in it called The Eagle and Me, which is one of the songs that Stephen Sondheim said he wished he had written. He, had, he made that list years ago of songs he wished oh, he had right, written. Oh, right, right. Um, which is sung by a, a, a slave. It's a, it's a civil right, it's about the Civil War, and it's also about the birth of women's rights, uh, you know, the, the bloomer, the beginning of the bloomers. And um, 
I really wanted to do it. It turns out to be not as good a show as I had hoped. <laughs> Well, it only um, ran for six hundred and fifty-seven yeah. performances. <laughs> and we, well, it was good. It was good. It was, it was it was one of those shows that wanted to be Oklahoma and almost was, but not quite. Um, and in the encore's production, the, one of the plot points in the show, which is based on history, um, is that the slave in it has shipped himself in a box from the South. That's how he escapes slavery mm. and arrives where the suffragettes are have a have a house on the Underground Railroad, basically. And he gets out of the box, and then he eventually sings this song, The Eagle and Me. What we didn't know was that we cast an actor, a wonderful, wonderful voice, um, who we had to bring in from Los Angeles to play this part, who had claustrophobia. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't Wait, want to go in the box. You can't write this He stuff, did not want to go in the box. <laughs> <laughs> we had to work out a way in which the back of the box was actually screened, and he could see out the whole time. Oh. I, well, but that's well, it ain't 1944, are, but I love it. There are three or four really superbly great songs in it, but it's not a great show. It's a, it's a good show. Okay. Ah, we talked about this with uh, Grover Dale. 1960, mm-hmm. 97 performances. That ain't good, by the way. Green Willow. Green Willow. Anthony Perkins. I mean, uh, Frank Lesser's first flop. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tell me about Green Willow. Uh, you know, we've, we didn't do it at Encores. We did a, a, a song from it in one of our concert shows at Encores. Um, it's a very ambitious score and a very twee kind of folky story. Mm-hmm. And I think Frank Lesser, who wrote music and lyrics and may have written the book or co-written the book, Music and lyrics, Frank Le- book by Lesser Samuels and Frank. And Frank Lesser, Lesser yeah. yeah. Um, I think Lesser Samuels was a was a screenwriter. I'm not sure actually. Joe um, Layton choreography. Yeah, I don't think Frank Lesser was completely at home. In the, the the guy who wrote Guys and Dolls and How to Succeed in Business, you put him in a rural fairy tale setting, and it was just, just like a mismatch. Yeah. Of some sort. But again, there are two fantastic ballads in it, and a what lot are the, of very what good are the music. ballads that are? Um, Summertime Love and Never Will I Marry. Never Will I Marry is just a staggeringly good song. Wow. I mean, you hear these songs from Flops, and you think there's a... Well, Never Will I Marry is a song that, you know, people... Frank Sinatra recorded it, I think, and various people. I think maybe even Streisand recorded it. Um, you know, these, these are rescue jobs. These are like this yeah. song would just go into oblivion unless somebody pulls it out of this essentially undistinguished show and makes something of it. Well, now that's an interesting point because I know back in the day, I, and we both know Marilyn May. She's kind yes, of a of friend of, of, of mine. Hi, Marilyn. Um, Hi, Marilyn. Back in the day, she used to record, like she was the original person who sang and recorded the title song for Cabaret right. because they released it as a record to build up people going for, to Broadway right. to buy tickets. It used to be... I mean, Broadway music really used to be pop music of the day, as you said. It it was the hit parade for a while. Yeah, it really was the hit parade. They would pull these songs and record them, and Frank Sinatra, Barbra Streisand. I mean, that's a little different, although I feel like late, like Hamilton sort of suddenly became like an album everybody knew. Yeah, there are albums like that, like the Jersey Boys album was a huge hit. I think the Evan Hansen album was was a big hit. Yeah. By and large, Broadway albums are not. They don't mean anything. They're they're souvenirs for the people who see the show. Right. Sort of like the uh, when Lincoln Center films a show, it's not really meant for broadcast. Yeah, right. It's just meant to put in a library right. and say. Look at an original, original cast album of something like I don't know, The Wedding Singer. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think they or were Greenwell. Well, Greenwell even back in 1960. Yeah. In those days, I mean, they recorded the album the first the Sunday after the. In those days, they performed Monday through Saturday. They would record the album right. on Sunday right after they opened, and it would be on the racks ten days later. Wow. 15 days later. They mixed it in two days. They put it Well, in I remember when I was in college and I took my musical theater course. Yeah. Because I did study my craft, darling. Of course. They always said, worst examples of what the shows actually sounded like. Because yeah. the people were tired. Yes, they, they were shoved tired. them in a studio, said, just do they it did, and they put They it did out. the whole thing in one day. They didn't yeah. have time. Well, I mean, the company original cast album documentary is, a, is an example of Which that. just came out on Criterion yeah. Collection. A little fantastic. commercial. They, it, they remastered it. Yeah. And they have the like Sondheim doing a, a voiceover, yeah. and, and Elaine Stritch. 
the interesting part of that is listening to Elaine Stritch explain what's actually happening when she can't sing it. Right. And then she comes back and just nails it and goes yeah. like, yeah, that's how you do it. Right. Like, Ten in the morning. screw all of you. <laughs> it's early morning and I just did it. Yeah. It's a, it's a great DVD. Everyone who loves Broadway should watch that DVD. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's an amazing, wonderful hour long. Yeah. And thing. to see those people so young. Yeah, very and, young. And to know what, came after that is yeah. sort of an amazing... And to hear that orchestra, there are several moments oh. when the camera uh, sound focuses entirely on the orchestra, and you yeah. just hear those orchestrations and that sound, and just, wow. Amazing. And I have to say, Company is like, that is my favorite song. To, there's something... The 70s were a, a big time of awakening for me yeah. as, a, as a human being, so... I went to University of Maryland. I had never done theater, and they did Company, and I said... Whatever that is, yeah. I need to be up to in part of that. Yeah. Because I just loved it. I was in college. I saw a company trying out in Boston. Um, and it was you know, earth shattering. I mean yeah. it was it was it was nothing like any Broadway show I had ever seen before. Oh, yeah. Nothing like yeah. it. Yeah. I you sort of couldn't believe it was happening. Yeah. And looking back you can see that Cabaret is sort of a stepping stone to it in a way. In a way, yeah. But um, with its fractured structure and all that. But company just no, I, 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 couldn't be, I just couldn't believe what you were watching. Yeah, and it, it combined several different styles. Yeah. Like those girls coming out as the Andrews sisters kind of a thing. Yeah. Like there's so... But I... It just... To this day, when I hear that music, it takes me right back to those yeah. moments. And that's what I love, that transportation of my spirit to yeah. that wonderful yeah. moment. Okay. 1960, London... 2,618 performances. Oh, I know what that is. Broadway, 1963. Yeah. 774 performances. Not as many, but enough. Contrast of London versus Broadway, David Merrick. Well, it's a very, very English show, is Oliver. Now, I only wish that I had with me the photograph of me playing Fagin in high school. I was an excellent Fagin. Do you have that photograph? I have it at home. Yeah. You're going to send it to us. Because we're going to show it I, right I, up here. Oh, no, I have right. to find it. I have to find it. I think all I have is the photograph of the curtain call, but you can see me with my beard partly falling off. And... <laughs> so, uh, Oliver, tell me about Oliver. Well, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a huge, it was the cats of its day in London. I mean, it was just oh the God. biggest, biggest hit. Oh God. I, I don't mean, I don't mean as a show. I just mean yeah. it was like a, a sensation unlike the British musical had seen in right. how, maybe forever, you know. And it came over here, it was not as well regarded, but it was, it was well regarded. It was certainly a hit. Um, 774 performances is a hit? In those days, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I, 500 performances was a hit in those days. Okay. Um, you know, you could get your money back in nine months, and then you had oh. three or four months of profits, and then you went on the road. It was fine. Oh, if only. Those were the days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it's a. I, I just listened to it recently, actually. It's a really good score. It's a. It's it's. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, in a way, you could say it's simplistic. It's not simplistic. It's simple. It's Irving Berlin like in that it, it, the melodies are real melodies, the lyrics are, are are just what they, you need them to be. It's not clever like Cole Porter. Right. Um, but it tells that story very compacted, considering that Oliver Twist is a thousand-page book or 800-page book. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's a very effective show. And the sad thing about it, in a way, is that because Cameron McIntosh bought, literally bought the show from Lionel Bart, who wrote it, he c controls the show completely, and it's never seen anymore, because he won't let it be done unless it's, he does it, and it's done in the way that he wants. And Huh. I mean, Oliver is a show that would be revived regularly, I would think. Not necessarily yeah. on Broadway, but on tours. and Yeah. You know, um, but you never see it. Because, I mean, I'm just looking at uh, Food, Glorious Food. Who who doesn't know this song? I mean, yeah. it's done by uh, <laughs> cabaret artists who maybe Doris Dears even done that on occasion. Uh, could be. I mean, uh, Consider Yourself. Who doesn't know this? Everybody knows Sung this. Sung by one of the monkeys. Really? I believe so. Wow. Like Davy Jones. Davy Jones. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Long mean, before there were be the monkeys. He was a Who Will like Buy? A, yeah. Great, great tune. I mean, these are... And that, and that's not the hit. The hit is As Long As He Needs Me. Well, and everybody knows that. Yeah. I mean, I remember in the 70s going to auditions and hearing that song sung by a few people. It was either that or Pippin. I <laughs> should say, since I don't think you're holding up the album, 
the album that I'm going to speak about, that as good as I was as Fagan, as a junior in high school, I was the worst King Arthur in the history of high school Camelots. <laughs> there has never been a worse one. I think you could do it now. Maybe. Yes. Okay, 1962. Mm -hmm. That's the first year I started going to the theater by myself. 65 performances. Oh. That. A new musical comedy. Back then. Oh, A Family Affair is the first show I ever saw twice. <laughs> <laughs> most that was people, the last show you only saw most, twice. <laughs> most people never saw it at all. I saw it twice. I made my parents take me to it for my birthday, my 13th birthday, because I was such a huge fan of Shelley Berman's comedy albums. Yes. Which I'm sure Taffy and Duke listen to all oh, the time. Yeah. Many all times. the time. Um, it's an interesting show. It was not a good show, really. I, I now see, and I went back and read it for encores and realized it's not really a very good show. But it's an interesting show for a lot of different, re for a bunch of different reasons anyway. First show Hal Prince ever directed. He was called in out of town after the director was fired. Mm. First show John Kander, first John Kander credit right. on Broadway as a composer. Without, he, no Ebb, just Kander. This is before Ebb, before he met Fred Ebb. Um, and it has three great songs in it. It has very pleasant music throughout. The lyrics are variable. They were written by uh, James Goldman and William Goldman, who were not really lyricists, but mm. the three of them were living together. Candor and the Goldman brothers were sh they were like starving artists sharing an apartment in oh. some place, and they wrote this show just because they you know they were all in the same place at the same time. <laughs> uh, but harmony and uh, there's a room in my house is a great great song and and a very short song called the summer is over beautiful beautiful song, but one of the little interesting highlights of this or sidelights of this show is that there's a room in my house, which is sung between the the would-be bride and groom. A family affairs about a wedding that's about to happen. Yeah. Uh, the, her name is Sally, and he sings, "Sally who loves me, Sally who needs me, Sally who will be my bride," and that's the reason Sally and Follies is named Sally, because really? he, according to Stephen Sondheim, he saw the show. I mean, he and Hal were very good friends, and he thought, "Boy, that name sings like a million bucks." <laughs> <laughs> and Sally, it is. And, and so there's Sally, you know, Sally standing by the door, Sally moving to the bed, Sally resting in my arms with her head upon my head. It's the three Sallies. That's a, it's a, you know, what do you know? And uh, this cast, Larry Kurt, Larry Kurt, Rita Gardner, who Rita the Gardner. Girl, she was the girl in Fantastics. Right, and Eileen Hecker, he Eileen Hecker, Hecker, Hecky. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, she sings "Summer Is Over" and she cannot sing, but she's heartbreaking. <laughs> but what a broad. Uh, Great. What? Great. So great. The, the Osterwall. Yeah. I mean, this is... It's a, it, it's a classic of its kind. It's a flop. Yeah. You put it on and you listen to it and you say, oh, that's a flop. And I love the... You know, I'm <laughs> the all about... Ball, yeah. I, and I love the lettering. It's sort of turn of the century. Yeah, it has little hello jolly... Show set in current Yeah. Times. It was just a big, you know, things went wrong on that show. Yeah. Okay. And great orchestrations by Robert Gensler. Red Gensler. 1964. Mm-hmm. 568 performances. Could be a hit. Maybe. Big, big press on the biracial kiss. And this is the last one we'll discuss. Oh, I know what this is. Golden Boy. Boy. Sammy Davis. Sammy Davis. I mean, come on, wait. You gotta see, look at the picture of Sammy Davis. Yeah, looks great. Yeah. Plays a boxer who... Before he became Sammy Davis, right? Yeah, well, no, he was already... Was he already Sammy sort of, Davis? He yeah. wasn't Sammy Davis. You okay. know, he was. Yeah. He was uh, a star. He was not the Las Vegas event that. Right. That he wasn't the Rat Pack. Yet. Right. But he was enough of a star so that, for instance, his solos in this show all had to be orchestrated by his arranger, even though the rest of the show oh. was orchestrated by someone else. Oh. He had that kind of power. Um, yes, it was a. The, 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 he, it's he's, the original play is about a Jewish boxer. Golden Boy by by Clifford Odets. They made him a black boxer from a black family. Falls in love with a white girl in the play. It's a Gentile girl and a Jewish boy, and um, it was it was it was controversial that they actually well sure 1964, you know, 1964 biracial it, it was the year and of the against civil, the law in some states still it, it was the year of the Civil Rights Act passed that year yeah um, the first Civil Rights Act not the Voting Rights Act right it was a year later. But um, beautiful score by Strauss and Adams. Um, so the days, right? I had can I had Candor with Family Affair. I had Strauss and Adams here. 
Um, we don't have any, we have Frank Lesser, we don't have any Bach and Harnick, but um, Broadway was in a great place, you know, um, yeah. in terms of talent. And well, you talent. read the names that yeah. either starred in it or wrote it, and you're just kind of blown away. Yeah. I mean, so many people sort of at the beginnings of their careers or really on the, on the upswing of it, like, it's it's amazing. It's it's like we said with that DVD. You see Sondheim as a yeah. very young man right. just trying to, and it, you know what happens after, and you just it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing. One of the interesting things about Golden Boy, I think, is that it was considered very daring in its day. Right, there was a biracial couple. They actually were having sex, although not on stage, obviously. Um, people were. It made people very nervous with how progressive it was mm. today. I don't think you could perform all of it because it has lyrics in it. It has a song called Don't Forget 127th Street, which I don't think anyone would sing today. No. Um, it, you know, it's like progressivism progresses. So this thing, which was so daring, is ne would now be slightly slightly poisoned. Yeah. Just by I, the times, by what happens. that People discover more and more about who they should be and what they should say and not say. And I love... The thing I also love about these old albums is this. The gatefold. The gatefold. I mean, it's got like the whole, like... It was a big deal. The entire story, pictures. Yeah. I mean... But, you know, cast albums back then were so successful that record companies put up all the money for some of these shows just to get the cast album rights. Oh. Well, I because know my, my parents Fair Lady, every one. My Fair Lady cast album had made Columbia a fortune. Yeah. Sound of Music's cast album a fortune. So... Record companies would pick two or three likely shows and give the producers $300,000, which is what it cost to produce a show back then. Well, it'd be nice for a producer to get $300,000 now for anything. It'd be nice to be able to produce anything for $300,000. <laughs> Gee, wouldn't it, though? Yeah. All right, so what's... To finish up, Jack, again, thank you for coming in. Oh, so happy to. Um, what, what's, what's next? What, two, 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 two parts. One, what do you... What do you see about the future of Broadway? What's your feelings about well, that? Well, I think we're in such a tricky place here, just as the pandemic allows us, it's not over yet, but allows us to go back under certain circumstances. It's very hard to predict what will happen commercially to Broadway. Um, artistically, I think it's a funny kind of time because I think you have two Broadways, basically. You have the big, spectacular musical events that are either Disney or they're based on a well-known movie or, so, you know, that are really big tourist attractions, which is not to say that some of them aren't very high quality, mm -hmm. but their reason for being produced is that they will have a wide, right. wide audience from around the world. And simultaneously, you have seven new black plays opening between now and, and New Year's. Um, you have musicals like, not on at the moment, but Fun Home and Bands Visit and is on at the moment, Hades Town, um, which are real attempts to push the art form forward without regard to, you know, an audience of tourists from around the world. Right. And so they, they, they live side by side. I don't think they're at war with each other. I think they're, no. they're neighbors. Yeah. And so how that evolves over time, I don't know. But uh, I, I, think, I think it's not a time to decry that there are some shows that are so venal in their commercial appeal that they sort of make us wince. Because at the same time, there are other shows that are trying to do things that have never been done before. Right. And they just coexist. And some of the big commercial venal ones are spectacularly good. And some of the really daring ones are really terrible. It, and it vice is, versa. And vice versa. It yeah. isn't one or the other. Yeah. I, I think when I started going to the Broadway theater in the early 60s, all musicals were more or less the same in one sense. They all had 28-piece orchestras. The music all sounded like Broadway music. You know, the stories, generally speaking, were tired businessman stories <laughs> with a few serious ones spread through. Now, you can go hear David Byrne, and you can go hear Hades Town, and you can go hear Aladdin, and you can go hear The Lion King, and you can also go hear a revival of The Music Man. I mean, you know, it's... You take your choice. There's a tremendous ferment of stuff out there. How it will work out commercially, I don't know. Right. And he, a little side note, like someone said to me, you can't do a you you can't do a big musical revival 
without a big star. I think that's probably true. Uh, Until something comes along and shows that it's not true. Right. Until someone says, well... I think funny. Uh, we have funny girl coming. We have with, funny girl coming with an right? amazingly talented performer. Performer not is a she big a, star. not a big star? It'll be right. interesting to see. Very which is funny because a funny girl was the first show my Taffy ever took me to on Broadway. Because we used to go on the Staten Island ferry, and I say, "Look at that crazy poster! What's that girl on the bro?" And she got so sick. She said, "Guess where we're going?" And I go, "What?" She goes, "Going to see that crazy poster." Yeah. I said, "What?" <laughs> and I don't really remember, but I remember. Here's the weirdest thing. Like, you know. I remember really only one number, rat a tat tat <laughs> Which is not in the movie. It's not in the movie. It's not even it. But for some it's reason. It's on the cast album. Yeah. Our boys go rat a tat tat rat a tat tat and put their mother where is that tat tat I mean, dressed as doughboys, tap yeah. dancing. Like, yeah. I don't even... I have and no you were, idea. And you were watching Streisand. Yeah, and know. I was watching Streisand. <laughs> like, that's what I remember. Yeah, well, we remember what we remember. We remember what we remember. Less and less each day. Yes, <laughs> less and, yes, less and less a day. So, last question. Yes. Um, what's next for Jack? I wish I knew. Um, I have been writing. I have been thinking about other kinds of shows. Um, without doing anything about any of them. But I really, I'm at a point in my life where uh, I have some decisions to make. I don't know what they are. I'm still consulting at City Center. I love that building and those people and those shows that they put on. But I think Encores has to change fairly drastically. I'd like to be part of that change, but you know, uh, in the the background. Um, I think there's, I, I don't feel bad about it. I feel like there's a, I have a deck of cards, and the deck of cards is still in the box. And I'm going to open the box. That's great. Well, it I, I will say, I have to say this to the camera. It's an honor being your friend. Well, it's an honor to know you and to feed <laughs> off of your energy and your unabashed knowledge and and energy about Broadway. I, I love our talks and our... You are way too kind. Oh. And I'm delighted to be your No, friend. I'm not. I'm really not kind at all. I, I, I don't meant to me. <laughs> but you are. It's well, a cheers to that, my cheers friend. Cheers to that. Thank you, and here's to Broadway. Here's to Broadway. Cheers. It's Doris Dears Barcode. Welcome to Doris Deer's Bar Cart, the place where we make the cocktails we drink here in the rumpus room. Today's cocktail that Jack Vertel and I enjoyed was the Caipirinha. So international. Jack is an Aquarian, the last air sign of the Zodiac, and people born under the star sign tend to be a little eccentric and free-spirited. And that, my friends, is the Jack I know. Accordingly, Aquarians pair well with Caipirinha, a light, zesty, yet punchy cocktail. The caipirinha is Brazil's national cocktail made with cachaça, which is similar to rum, but instead of being distilled from molasses, a byproduct of sugarcane processing, it's distilled from the fermented juice of sugarcane. Sugar production was mostly switched from the Madeira Islands to Brazil by the Portuguese in the 16th century. In Madeira, a guante de cana, I don't know, my accents are terrible, is made by distilling sugarcane juice into liqueur. And the pot stills from Madeira were brought to Brazil to make what today is also called cachaça. The process dates from 1532, when one of the Portuguese colonists brought the first cuttings of sugarcane to Brazil from Madeira. Cachaça can only be produced in Brazil, where, according to a survey, 396 million U.S. gallons are consumed annually. Well, no wonder those Brazilians are so much fun. Ever been to Carnival, darling? Woo! (laughs) The drink is prepared by mixing lime and the sugar together, then adding the liqueur. It has a distinct sweet and sour element, like Aquarians who can be sweet, but also have a stubborn streak. And now I present to you the Doris Deer Caipadinha. The recipe is half fresh lime cut into four wedges, two teaspoons of sugar, and two ounces of cachaça. 
Now, place the limes and sugar in an old-fashioned glass. Here we go. This is fun. This is like chemistry. <laughs> now, muddle them together with my new muddler. Isn't that wonderful? Ooh, yes. We're pros now. My goodness. Let's see. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, it releases all that lime juice. It's quite marvelous. And it smells delicious. Okay. Now, we add ice. Yay! And we fill with the cachaça. Fill, fill, fill. Ooh, we're going to have a good time today. Ooh. Well, I hope you enjoyed your stay in the rumpus room today. I love when friends drop by and we share some fun ideas and bring some joy to the world around us. Now, don't forget, you can head over to www.doristeer.com forward slash what? Girl, G-U-R-L hyphen talk for all the recipes and hints from today's show. I hope you'll drop by for the rumpus room again and more Doris Deer's Girl Talk. Please stay safe and hugs and love from Doris Deer. And remember, a dress doesn't get you anywhere. It's the life you live in the dress that matters. See you soon. Off to Carnival! Da, 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 da. Drink. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. We're going to have some fun tonight. It's Doris. It's Doris, dear. She's a girl on the street. She'll show up with a sweet girl. She'll show up with a sweet girl. Hi everybody, Doris Deer here, America's Perfect Housewife. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for sticking by myself and all of my artist friends over the past year and a half. It's a new normal, but the arts are coming back. That's right, and we're gonna come back strong. And I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, and thank you from the bottom of my Doris Deer heart. Please remember, a dress doesn't get you anywhere. It's the life you live in the dress that matters. <laughs>